Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, Dickey Center presentation of Rosa Brooks, who will uh, discuss her book, How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything, as well as various and sundry other uh, issues. Um, and um, although I think most of them are not here to get the congratulations, I did want to uh, say to the War and Peace fellows that they have excellent taste in picking this book and this author uh, as one they wanted to uh, bring to Hanover, but if they're not here to hear it, well, that's all there is to it. Uh, Rosa Brooks is a professor of law at Georgetown and currently associate dean for graduate programs there, as well as a senior fellow at the New America Foundation. And she is also a columnist for foreign policy. Uh, from 2009 through 2011, she served at the Pentagon as counselor to the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Michelle Flournoy, who's also visited here. Uh, at the Pentagon, her portfolio included rule of law, human rights issues, global engagements, and strategic communications, which was a melancholy and indeed dismal subject that we worked on together. Uh, she has been a senior advisor at the State Department, a consultant for Human Rights Watch, and an, and a columnist for the Los Angeles Times as well. Um, her book, I should, I should add, uh, was a New York Times notable book of the year and selected by Military Times as one of the 10 best books of the year. Um, Rosa, in addition, I should say, is an expert on international law, human rights law, and national security. She has an undergraduate degree from Harvard where she studied history and literature, a master's in so social anthropology from Oxford where she was a Marshall Scholar, and a law degree from Yale. She is also the author of Ken Might Make Rights, the Rule of Law After Military Interventions, which was published in 2006 uh, by Cambridge University Press. She appears on television quite frequently and is part of the podcast team at Deep State Radio, um, where uh, she specializes in the highest quality snarkiness. <laughs> Uh, in person, Rosa likes to affect the, pers the persona of someone who has a very hard time kicking a single memo out the door, and we'll say, oh, it's so hard, there's so much to do, but uh, I think she does that as a kind of apology to the rest of us for being so devilishly productive. Um, well, so much for the facts about Rosa. On a, on a more personal note, um, I want to uh, direct you, if you have her book, to page 17, where she uses a phrase that I love so much that I, I actually thought I'd coined it. She calls a particular US military installation an irony-free zone. Um, well, suffice it to say that Rosa Brooks is about as far as you can get in, uh, in humanity from being an irony-free zone. Uh, she has a fabulous wit, as readers of her book, articles or tweets will know. Uh, I believe she is the only person I've ever seen in an interagency meeting cross her eyes in exasperation at the baloney she was hearing. <laughs> I think that's actually true. And uh, she is a compulsive slayer of sacred cows, a toppler of false idols, and someone who refuses to be deterred from calling out her own team when it commits some blunder or another. And I'll just uh, close with one anecdote, uh, and I'm not gonna look at Rosa because I'm not sure she's gonna like it. Uh, a few months after she left the Pentagon and went back to being a law professor, I got a call from a mutual friend who was then uh, an aide at the White House who asked me if I'd seen Rosa's latest article in foreign policy. I hadn't, so she drew my attention to an essay entitled, uh, Obama Needs a Grand Strategy. Uh, suffice it to say, Rosa had been working for Obama just a short period of time before. Uh, she mentioned to me that the Secret Service had had to restrain uh, then Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough, who was wielding a knife, pledging revenge, um, and uh, we all had to just admire Rosa for her bravery in um, saying what was on her mind. So uh, that's Rosa, and I'm really delighted to welcome her here to Dartmouth. Rosa, the, uh, the podium is all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. It's, it's terrific to be here and, uh, and thank those of you who willingly got up and moved a little bit, a little bit closer. See, Dan, Dan thinks this is a very shocking law professor's thing to do, but the, the, the thing that law professors really like to do, and this, by the way, is the reason being a law professor is the biggest scam in academia, is we don't actually lecture, we just call on our students and ask them questions, and that saves us from having to do any preparation. We just say things like, Mr. Benjamin, would you describe how everything became war and the military became everything? And then, we, and then we grill them on it for the rest of the hour. But I'm not actually going to do that to you. Um, 
uh, I, I really will talk about the book and not just make Dan talk about it. Uh, since, uh, e since even Dan, I'm not sure he's read it as carefully as he should have. Um, but anyway, it, it is terrific to be here. Uh, it, it is, in fact, true that I, I made the uh, President's Chief of Staff very angry uh, on more than one occasion. That's my only claim to fame. Um, um, but uh, I'm going to talk mostly tonight uh, about the, the subject of the book that Dan mentioned, How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything. I should start by saying that I was, it was not a completely uh, foregone conclusion that I was going to end up working at the Pentagon. Um, uh, I come from a family of left-wing anti-war activists. Um, uh, I think it's safe to say that the only time my, my mother stepped foot at the Pentagon, for instance, was to try to levitate it in the 1960s. And many of my earliest memories involve uh, it being brought as a small child to anti-war demonstrations in the, in the early 1970s, for instance. Um, in fact, when I started uh, uh, working at the Pentagon, when I got an offer, a job offer, which came from uh, Dan's, Dan's also former colleague and friend, Michelle Flournoy, to join her team when she went over to the Pentagon as the undersecretary for policy. Um, it took me a few weeks to even work up the courage to, to tell my mother. I was a little afraid she was going to disown me or something. Um, but I, I finally did. And, and in fact, after a, a few months uh, of working there, I finally said, um, you know, Mom, why don't you come and have lunch with me at the Pentagon? My mother lives quite near me in, in Alexandria, Virginia. So, so my mom uh, comes to visit me at the Pentagon, uh, and she, how many of you have been in the Pentagon? All right, a good smattering here, but, but so those of you who have been in the Pentagon recently will, will recognize some of what I say. So my mother, she takes the metro from Alexandria. She you know, comes up the escalators. We get her through the layers of security in the, the visitor center, and we go up more escalators, and we're walking through the hallways, and we walk past the CVS, and we walk past the deli, and we walk past the sign for Starbucks, and we walk past the florist, and we walk past the bank, and we walk past the optician, we walk past the barber shop, and we walk past the chocolate shop. And at a certain point, my mom just stops short in the, in the hallway, which is not a smart thing to do in the Pentagon, because people are always like streaming past you, and everybody's very, very busy all the time, so you're you know blocking traffic and so forth. So she stops, so I stop too, and everybody's shh, going around us. And I said, Mom, what's matter and she's looking around and she says you're telling me that the heart of American military power is a shopping mall <laughs> and I said well you know uh, pretty much um, you know she wasn't far wrong uh, the Pentagon uh, as those you'll learn if you go on an official tour which are conducted by Marines who have the unbelievable skill of walking backwards uh, as they deliver their discourse. This is a sight to see. If you're ever at the Pentagon, you should definitely get a tour. So the Marines who walk backwards will tell you the Pentagon has 17.5 miles of corridors. Uh, it has 23,000 employees, a mixture of military and civilian. Uh, I believe that it still is the largest office building in the world, uh, uh, beating out places like the Empire State Building in terms of sheer amount of office space and number of people working there in the building. And over the years, those 17.5 miles of corridors have not surprisingly sprouted dozens of shops and restaurants catering to the needs of the 23,000 employees. Um, in fact, over time, I think it is fair to say that the US military itself has come to offer uh, a similar kind of one-stop shopping experience for the nation's top policymakers. And it's a little bit uh, surreal at times at the Pentagon you can buy a new pair of running shoes. There's a little sporting goods store deep in a sub-basement. You can buy a new pair of running shoes, or you could order uh, the Navy to patrol for pirates off the Horn of Africa. You could, if you're not feeling so good, you could get some Tylenol or something at the CVS, or you could send a team of Army Special Forces medics to fight malaria in Chad. Uh, you can buy yourself a new cheap cell phone if you broke or lost yours, uh, or if you're sufficiently senior, you could uh, task the National Security Agency with eavesdropping on the cell phone communications of terror suspects. And I kid you not, you can purchase a small chocolate replica of a fighter jet at the chocolate store, um, or you could order up a drone strike in, in Yemen or Syria or Libya. You name it, the Pentagon supplies it. Uh, my friend uh, 
retired Army Lieutenant General Dave Barno once commented that the US military has become like a, like a super Walmart with everything under one roof. And at this point, I think we've seen three successive presidential administrations have been eager consumers of everything that the Pentagon has to offer. But needless to say, the military's transformation into the, the world's biggest one-stop shopping outfit is not necessarily a cause for celebration. Um, I think it's both the product and the driver of some really seismic changes in how we Americans and American policymakers think about war with consequent challenges both to our laws and to the military itself as a human institution. So here's the, to, to oversimplify somewhat, here's the vicious circle in which we now find ourselves when it comes to uh, the role of the military. Uh, as the US has faced, particularly in the post 9-11 environment, novel security threats from novel quarters, like threats that emanate from geographically diffuse non-state terror networks, uh, from cyberspace, from the impact of poverty, genocide, or political repression, uh, as we face these novel threats, we've come to view more and more new threats through the lens of war. And we've started to ask our military to take on an ever-expanding range of non-traditional tasks. But when you view more and more things through the lens of war, uh, that also brings more and more spheres of human activity into the ambit of the law of war with its much greater tolerance for secrecy, for violence and coercion, and with its reduced protections for individual rights, human rights. And meanwhile, when you ask the military to take on more and more tasks, uh, you have to have higher military budgets. If you have to have higher military budgets, you have to look for savings elsewhere, so you start to freeze or cut the budgets of the civilian foreign policy agencies like the State Department, USAID, and so forth. Uh, and as budget cuts cripple those civilian agencies, their capabilities dwindle, which means that you start to look to the military to pick up the slack, which further expands its role. You know, everybody knows the old cliche, uh, if, you're only, if your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It applies here in the sense that if your only functioning government institution is the military, everything starts to look kind of like a war, uh, and war rules start looking like they apply everywhere displacing peacetime rules and norms and institutions. And of course, when everything looks like a war, everything starts to look like a job for the military, displacing civilian institutions, undermining their credibility while overloading the military itself. Um, so, okay, who cares, right? What's at stake here when we have this, this vicious circle going on? Um, I actually think that more and different things are at stake than, than people typically think about. Um, and I'm gonna, in a few minutes, I'm gonna get kind of wonky and law professorist, but I'll, I'll, I'll put that off for another couple minutes. Um, I, and, and since we're here at Dartmouth, uh, uh, I'll, I'll quote Shakespeare first before I do any painful law stuff. Uh, think about famous lines from Henry V. Uh, In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger, stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favored rage. What does Shakespeare mean? This is, this is the perfect moment for like a Socratic exercise, isn't it? What does Shakespeare mean, Mr. Benjamin? <laughs> oh, no, all right, don't worry. Okay, you don't actually. <laughs> he he kind of went like, ah. Oh no, she's really doing it. She's asking me a question. No, but you get the idea, right? The, the, the basic concept here is that in wartime, we expect behavior that is dramatically different than peacetime. In wartime, we, we expect and indeed require and applaud behavior that in peacetime we consider uh, abhorrent. Um, uh, we expect warriors to act in ways that we would consider immoral and illegal in peacetime. Um, and this is fairly basic, right? It's so basic, in fact, that I think we have a tendency to forget it, um, that you know, if you go outside of this auditorium and you, you, know, you take the nearest blunt, heavy object, which might be my book, um, and you, know, you wait for somebody to walk by and you bash them on the head with it and they fall down dead because they're the favorite character of all law professors, they're the eggshell, thin-skulled plaintiff, and they're dead, 
what's going to happen is that presumably the police are going to be called. They're going to come. You're going to get arrested. You're going to be charged with murder. You're probably going to go to jail, uh, et cetera. And if you, when the police say to you, but why? Why did you do this? If your answer is because he was my enemy, you know, that will just get the guys in white coats involved too. Uh, it doesn't get you off the hook. On, in contrast, if you are a soldier uh, and it's wartime and your enemy, you have an enemy and your enemy goes waltzing by and you bash him on the head with the nearest blunt object and kill them, you may in fact be required to do that. If you say, no, oh, I don't want to, you might find yourself prosecuted under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And if you do it, you might find yourself getting a medal, right? So we've got clear contrast in the types of behavior that we consider acceptable and required in wartime and in peacetime, uh, which in turn means that we really need to know the difference between war and peace. Um, we tolerate behavior in wartime by warriors that we would consider unacceptable and immoral in peacetime, uh, mainly because we view war as a temporary exception, as a sort of horrible thing, but it's gotta happen, and horrible things have to happen in wartime, and we're gonna make exceptions to all of our normal moral and legal rules, but that's okay because war is over here it's sort of inside of a box. It, we, we assume it doesn't spill over into ordinary life, so we can tolerate this sort of otherwise unacceptable behavior in wartime. But needless to say, when we get into a, a moment, a political, cultural moment, when the boundaries around warfare blur, when, when the boundaries between war and peace, war and not war, get blurrier, and the boundaries around the military begin to blur, what, we, what happens is we start losing our ability to figure out what behavior we should be praising and what behavior we should be condemning. And when, what set of rules should apply to whom, under what circumstances, which actions, which killings should get medals or get you sent to jail. It becomes harder and harder to know the difference. For this very reason, uh, for most of human history, human societies have tried really, really hard to draw sharp lines between the worlds of war and the world of peace, between the role of the warrior and the role of the civilian. Until less than a century ago, for instance, most Western societies insisted that wars should be formally declared, should take place on clearly delineated battlefields, and be fought by uniformed military personnel operating within specialized, hierarchical military organizations. In different societies and at earlier times, uh, humans developed other kinds of rituals to demarcate the lines between war and not war, warrior and civilian, uh, from war drums and elaborate face painting for warriors to complex initiation rituals for young men when they became warriors. I'll give you just a few of my favorite examples. This was for me, writing this book, this was my favorite part as a one-time anthropology student was researching this. Um, uh, the old Norse berserkers who give us our modern word berserk uh, were warriors who would don the pelts of uh, predatory animals like wolves and bears when they went into battle. And they believed that they literally shape-shifted. They believed that when they, when they donned those pelts and did the accompanying rituals that they became predatory animals themselves and took on the attributes of those vicious predators in battle. And in fact, their behavior in war was considered so non-human, so across the line in terms of their sheer brutality that that's the origin of our modern word to go berserk. Uh, the Navajo of the American Southwest um, literally spoke a different language when they went off to war. The warriors would leave their home village and they would adopt a dialect with different vocabulary, different verb forms uh, that was reserved for warfare. Uh, when they came back, presumably victorious, because usually if you weren't victorious, you didn't come back, uh, they would draw a line in the desert sand. They would stand on the side of the line closer to enemy territory, and they would, they would face the enemy territory. Then they would turn around, step over the line, and resume the ordinary language. The Navajo, like many Native American groups, actually had uh, war chiefs and peace chiefs. Um, the actual locus of government authority would change depending on whether you were at war or not. The peace chiefs were normally hereditary chiefs, um, but during wartime, they would uh, 
Their power would, would be ceded to elected merit-based wartime chiefs. So even who was in charge, what form of government you had depended on whether you were at war or not. Uh, and a final example, the, the Makao of Papua New Guinea um, had very elaborate rituals uh, for warriors preparing to go into battle. They would sing certain songs, they would apply certain types of paints on their face, and among other things, they had to abstain from certain foods and abstain from sexual relations with their wives prior to going into battle. Uh, as the war sorcery took over their bodies, then they would go off to war, they would come back, but they couldn't resume normal social relations because the war sorcery was still uh, flowing through their bodies, and they had to once again go through a period of sexual abstinence uh, to let the war sorcery dissipate because the Mikhail believed that if the warriors had sexual relations with their wives too soon, that the war sorcery would enter both of their bodies and kill them both, that war was seen as literally toxic to ordinary community life and relationships. Um, we're not actually all that different, right? We, we hear this stuff and we think, oh, how quaint, how charming and primitive. Um, but how, anybody here is a veteran? A few of you, yeah. So think about what, what you do and what we go through and what our, our young soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines go through to this day. Um, uh, you enlist or you go off to a military academy and, and we, we shear your hair. Uh, we make our soldiers, our warriors, display special symbols on their chests, engage in carefully choreographed dance ceremonies known as drill, which have no practical purpose except to create a sense of identity, uh, a sense of shared identity, you know, that whatever purpose they once had doesn't exist any longer, um, but we still do it. Um, and in fact, we, much like the berserkers uh, and many other human groups of warriors, we, we name our weapon systems and our uh, so on after fearsome predators, the, the hornet, the black hawk, the reaper, uh, as if we too imagine that we will take on the attributes of these fierce beasts in battle. Um, and despite all of the changes ushered in by the 9-11 attacks in 2001, most of us still prefer to view war as a distinct and separate sphere, one that should not intrude into our ordinary lives of soccer games and office buildings and shopping malls. Uh, and we relegate, the war, we relegate war, this separate thing, to the military, a separate institution that we simultaneously uh, lionize and ignore. We like to think that war is an easily recognizable exception to the normal state of affairs, uh, and we think of the military as an institution that we can easily, if somewhat tautologically, explain as the institution that does war. War is what the military does, the military is the institution that does war. Uh, the problem, as all of you know, right, and this was something that I think people were surprised by 15 years ago today, nobody, nobody's surprised by this, everybody knows this, uh, the problem is that in a world that is rife with transnational terror networks, with cyber threats, with disruptive non-state actors, this just isn't true anymore. Uh, our traditional categories, war, peace, warrior, civilian, are increasingly becoming almost useless as analytic categories and indeed as legal categories. Um, here's where I'm going to start getting a little law professory. Um, you know, in a, in a cyber war, in a war on terrorism, um, you can't have any boundaries in time or in space. You can't say, here's the battlefield. You can't point to the map. Remember all those great World War II maps that we all grew up looking at? You know, you can't say, aha, you know, here's a neutral state. Here, the war is here, but not here. Um, we can't articulate a circumstance in which a war might end, you know, war on terrorism. I mean, there's no one there to take a surrender or assign a peace treaty in many cases in the kinds of modern battles that we're fighting at the moment with these very diffuse, decentralized organizations. We're not sure what counts as a weapon. Uh, a hijacked passenger plane, uh, a line of malicious computer code. We can't even define the enemy increasingly. Uh, although the US has been engaged in military action in Syria, for instance, for some years now, uh, I think that uh, no one, seems particularly clear, including my friends who still work in the Pentagon, no one seems particularly clear 
if our enemy is a terrorist organization, an insurgent group, a loose-knit collection of individuals, a uh, prox proxy army of the Iranians or the Russians, or chaos itself, uh, no one seems to quite know. And we've also, I think, lost, increasingly lost any coherent principled basis for distinguishing between combatants and civilians. Uh, is a Chinese hacker or a Russian hacker a, a combatant? Um, what about a financier who raises money for Somalia's al-Shabaab organization or a Pakistani teenager who shares extremist recruiting propaganda on Facebook and social media or a Russian engineer who's paid by ISIS to maintain captured oil fields? Uh, so let me go back to what's at stake here. Um, and this is the law professory part. When there's a war, the law of war applies. Um, there's a whole body of both international, it's both international law and it's been integrated into our domestic law uh, as well. Um, that applies when there's an armed conflict and doesn't apply when there's not, um, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, in fact, we, and like lawyers, we of course have fancy Latin terms for this. The law of armed conflict is what we call the lex specialis, the special law which applies in the special circumstance of armed conflict, AKA war. The lex generalis, the general law, applies the rest of the time in general. Uh, so when you've got the exception, you get the exceptional special law. Rest of the time, we've got normal law. Um, and the law of war, law of armed conflict, and a lot of associated law that aren't strictly speaking part of the law, the international law of armed conflict or domestic law, a lot of associated law that relates to national security issues, um, that whole body of law, domestic and international, um, gives states and their agents an enormous amount of latitude when it comes to using lethal force and other forms of coercion. Uh, but peacetime law is the opposite. Peacetime law tends to emphasize individual rights, due process, accountability, go back to the example I gave, you bash somebody over the head and they die. Law of war says, Combatants in a war have what we call combatant immunity. It is lawful, it is not a criminal act to kill, to kill an enemy combatant in wartime. Um, on the other hand, if you kill another human being in peacetime, you're usually in pretty big trouble, right? Um, so when we lose the ability, as I think we increasingly have done, to distinguish in a reliable, consistent, and principled way between what counts as war and what doesn't count as war, who counts as a warrior, a soldier, a combatant, who doesn't count as a, as a combatant, we lose the ability to draw any clear, consistent, or principled dis distinction between when we should apply the law of war and when we don't, which in turn, in turn means that we lose any principled basis for frankly making the most vital decisions a democracy can make. Uh, for instance, which matters, if any, should be beyond the scope of judicial review. You've heard many times, oh, you can't have a, court, can't have a courthouse on the battlefield. Um, uh, we generally say that you, know, you don't need a warrant to kill the enemy during battle. It would be crazy. You don't, you don't need a judge to say, yes, in fact, he isn't. You know, when we picture you know, D-Day, and you think, can you imagine having a court would have to weigh in on whether you can fire your weapon at that German machine gun nest? That's crazy. Uh, so the law of armed conflict assumes that you don't get judicial review. Um, um, whereas peacetime law says, of course, you, know, you don't take the life of someone, particularly not a citizen, without a judicial proceeding. Um, when we can't distinguish between war and not war and warriors and civilians, we lose the ability to decide when a government can have secret laws. Uh, we lose the ability to decide when is it appropriate for the government to, for instance, monitor the electronic communications of its, of its citizens or censor their communications. In wartime, the legal framework for wartime is pretty tolerant of that. It says, yeah, you know, when there's a war, sometimes you have to do that. Uh, and no, you don't get to complain about it just the way it is. The war won't last forever. It'll be over soon, so deal with it while it's happening, and we generally accept that. Uh, if we can't tell the difference between war and not war, combatants and not combatants, we don't know who we can imprison, for how long, under what circumstances, with what level of due process. Uh, is, or is holding somebody at Guantanamo for 16 years. Uh, if there's a war and they are legitimately detainees in a war, you can hold a detainee in a war for the duration of the conflict. 
probably the Geneva Convention's drafters didn't imagine that conflicts were going to go on for 16 years, but the, the basic principle is there. On the other hand, if it's not a war or they're not combatants, then you have preventive detention, which is a pretty big no-no for uh, ordinary rule of law uh, perspective. Um, and finally, if you don't know what's a war and what's not and who's a warrior and who's not, you don't know when and against whom lethal force can be used. And to make it really concrete, and this is an issue that both Dan and I worked on when we were in the government, uh, take a US uh, drone strike against a terrorist suspect. Um, if we're pretty convinced that you know, so-and-so in Yemen or Libya or Somalia um, is a combatant in an armed conflict with the United States, then a drone strike that targets that person, kills them with a missile, is morally and legally identical to an American soldier on D-Day shooting at a German soldier, right? There's, there's, they're just identical from a legal perspective and they're identical from a, from a moral perspective. On the other hand, if we're not completely convinced that there is a war on terrorism that extends to this group or this region or this group in this region, or we're not entirely convinced that that suspect, that target, is a combatant, counts as a combatant, or as a civilian directly participating in hostilities, if we're not so sure about those things, if we think any one of those is maybe not a really ironclad case, well, then the US is going around the world murdering people, which is not really a great thing for the US to be doing, right? And we really want to know the difference, right? We really want to be on the right side of that one. We want to be, you know, if we're going to be killing people, we want it to be lawful wartime targeting of enemy combatants, not extrajudicial slaughter in other countries, right? So we, it's really important to be able to tell the difference. The trouble is, as I've already said, when we expand what we label war, when we get fuzzier and fuzzier on what counts as war, we lose our ability to figure out which is which. And that's kind of where we are right now. This has institutional implications for the military as well, and, and uh, the book itself, there's sort of two interwoven stories in the book. One is a story about law and the rule of law and what happens when your categories stop making sense. Um, the other story is really a story about the military as an institution. Uh, and, and the two are interrelated, obviously, because when we expand what we label, label war, we also lose our ability to make sound decisions about what is appropriately a task for the military and what should better and more appropriately be left to civilians. Uh, today, we have American military personnel operating in nearly every country on Earth. I think it was about 172 countries at last I checked. Uh, it's always changing, of course. Um, uh, and those military personnel do nearly every job on Earth. They launch special operations raids, and they launch agricultural reform projects. They plan airstrikes and plan small business development initiatives. They train parliamentarians. They produce TV soap operas. They patrol for pirates. They monitor global email communications. They design programs to prevent human trafficking. And it turns out they do a lot of cattle vaccination as well. For some reason, that's really a big thing. Um, uh, many years ago when I was uh, in law school, I, I interviewed for a job uh, at the managing consulting company McKinsey, and they like to do these interviews, I'm sure they still do this, um, where they, they give you, they throw all these hypothetical scenarios at you, uh, and you're supposed to, I guess, answer like a management consultant. You're supposed to show that you have the sort of management consultant instinct in your answers, and one of the scenarios that I was given in, in an interview was um, something along these lines. It was. So you run a mom and pop general store in a small town and business is great, but then one day you hear that a Walmart is moving in uh, a block away. What do you do? You know, and, and I said something like, roll over and die, it's all over. You know, I give up, um, which was, I'm pretty sure was not the, the right answer from a, I think I was supposed to say something like, you know, I will start serving artisanal Aztec soy chocolate lattes and, you know, find a niche or whatever. But, but we all know that, in fact, my first answer was probably the right one. You know, when, when Walmart shows up, you're doomed if you're a little mom and pop shop. Uh, and like Walmart, today's military can marshal vast resources and can exploit economies of scale 
uh, that are in ways that are impossible for little mom and pop operations. And like Walmart, the, the tempting one-stop shopping convenience that the US military can provide to policymakers has a devastating effect on smaller, more traditional enterprises, in this case, uh, enterprises such as the State Department and USAID, um, which are steadily shrinking into irrelevance in our steadily more militarized world. Uh, the Pentagon is not necessarily, and in fact not generally, as good at promoting agricultural economic reform than the State Department or USAID. But unlike state ASID and other civilian organizations, the Pentagon has millions of employees who are willing to work insane hours in terrible conditions, and the Pentagon is open 24-7. Of course, it's fashionable to despise Walmart um, for its, its cheap, tawdry goods, its, its sheer vastness and ubiquity. Uh, and also, I think, for the, the human pain that we suspect lies at the heart of the enterprise, most of the time we prefer not to see it. We, we uh, use our zoning laws to exile Walmart and its other big box friends off to the, the hinterlands. So we don't actually have to look at them. We just like to look at the little boutique show stores, which are cuter, on Main Street. We don't want Walmart on our Main Street. Um, but much as we hate it, much as we love to hate places like Walmart, you know, most of us would be hard pressed to live without it. You know, sooner or later everybody finds themselves at Walmart because it's just too darn convenient and it's open late at night and it's got everything. Um, and so we're gonna go there sooner or later. And I think that as the US military struggles to define its role and mission today, it evokes similarly contradictory attitudes in the civilian population. Uh, civilian government officials want a military that costs less but provides more, that will stay deferentially out of strategy discussions but be eternally available to ride to the rescue. We want a military that will prosecute our ever expanding and blurring wars but not ever ask us to face any of the difficult questions, the difficult moral and legal questions that are created by the eroding boundaries between war and peace. And we want a military that will solve every global problem in a heartbeat, but the rest of the time will be content to stay safely quarantined on isolated bases separated from the rest of us by barbed wire fences, anachronistic rituals, uh, and acres of cultural misunderstanding. And indeed, even as the boundaries around war have blurred and the military's activities have expanded, the US military itself as a human institution has grown, I think, ever more sharply delineated from the broader society that it is charged with serving and protecting, leaving fewer and fewer civilians, by the way, with the, the knowledge and the confidence to raise questions about how we define war, how the military operates, and so forth. Is it too late to change this? I don't know. It's funny, I, the, this book came out um, uh, right before the election of 2016, and, and as we were, you know, gearing up for the book to come out, I, I sort of thought, oh, you know, I missed my moment, all these trends which seem so clear, I think they may start kind of reversing, and then Donald Trump was elected, and everybody said, you were so prescient, and I thought, huh, how about that? So the good news for me as a, as a writer was that, that all the trends that I highlighted, if, if anything, I think have accelerated under, under the Trump administration, um, the bad news is that the trends have accelerated under the Trump administration. Um, so I don't know if we can change this, right? I mean, on the, here's, here's the glass half full version. Um, you know, on the one hand, sure, of course we can change it. You know, no divine power proclaimed that calling something war should free us from the ordinary constraints of morality or common sense. And no divine power said this task but not that task should be the province of people wearing a particular kind of uniform. You know, we human beings came up with the concepts, the definitions, the laws, and the institutions that in some ways now trap and confound us. Uh, and they are not any more eternal than the rituals and the categories used by the Makeo of Papua New Guinea or the Berserkers or the Navajo in the early 19th century uh, or any of the other human tribes that have gone before us. You know, that the, the legal framework that I talk about that is very permissive in wartime uh, very unpermissive in peacetime, 
this is really a product primarily of the post-World War II environment. Um, uh, it was created, the, this particular legal framework was created for certain normative purposes. Uh, we created it, we can change it. If it's not serving us, if it's confusing us, if it's making it harder to figure out what to do, we can change it. Um, we don't have to accept a world that's filled with boundaryless wars that can't end, in which the military has lost any coherent sense of mission or purpose. Uh, and, and that sounds vague, but in some sense, it's actually not that hard. I mean, uh, when you take something like drone strikes and targeted killings, if we worry about the moral and legal ambiguity there, uh, you know, it's not that hard to say, hey, throw out that old rule book. Let's instead focus on what we're trying to achieve here. And what we're trying to achieve, I think, has less to do with making these technical legal distinctions, lawful targeting of a combatant or not, and more to do with saying, hey, we have some pretty deep instincts as Americans that say when the state uses lethal force, there should be accountability for that, that there should be no unaccountable use of force, period. And if this particular action at this particular moment seems to slip between the cracks or, or be, be sort of riddled with so much ambiguity that we don't feel satisfied no matter how we come out, okay, so then let's create the institutions and the rules that would ensure us that this is a little different from D-Day. It's a little different from the police picking somebody up on the street, but it's also a little different from D-Day. You know, and what set of rules do we think would be appropriate that would allow both the right amount of flexibility, recognizing that things can change rapidly, but also be able to ensure both Americans and, our, and the rest of the world that we don't just go around the world killing people and saying, yeah, we can't tell you why, it's a secret. Uh, but trust us, you know, that, that, that it's not, it's, if you take it issue by issue, it's not actually that impossible. Uh, and I think the same is true when you think about surveillance, when you think about detention, and when you think about the whole cluster of issues that sort of comes along with this. Um, I think we're gonna, you know, I'd like us to change these things. We have essentially binary rules, war, not war, combatant, not combatant, in a world that is increasingly non-binary, and we, we certainly can change that. Will we? Will we have the political will? There, I'm much more skeptical. Uh, we, we don't have a terribly engaged citizenry at the moment. Uh, Congress is, uh, if anything, perhaps less engaged than the American public on these issues, so I'm not super optimistic, at least anytime soon, that this is gonna change. Um, uh, I don't think, you know, interesting one, and one question I'm always asked is, well, doesn't the military like it to see their, you know, their role expanding? And I think the answer to that is generally speaking, no. <laughs> that military leaders tend not to feel all that enthusiastic about presiding over the relentless Walmartization of the American military. Uh, I think they feel fear probably correctly that in the end, if the U.S. is over-reliant on an ever-expanding military, that we risk destroying not only the civilian competition but the military itself and that the military under constant pressure to be all things to all people uh, eventually finds itself unable to offer anything much of value to anyone. Um, I think I'll stop there on that, on that uh, uplifting and, and cheerful note um, and uh, happy to, to take questions or, or, or not because Dan is looking at me like pointing at that chair. Okay, I'm happy to go sit in that chair and do whatever Dan tells me to do. Okay, so, um, whoa, that's uh, loud. Um, so I thought maybe we would start talking about the points raised in your book, and then we can have a broader conversation, we can come back to some of the things not talked in, not spoken about in your uh, book. Um, I mean, what I like about the title of the book is that it seems to be getting at something that we felt acutely at the State Department, which was uh, uh, DOD is uh, sort of eating our lunch as well as breakfast and dinner, and that, I think, is a big problem as they take on more and more, and the only institution that the U.S. public seems to be eager to fund right now uh, is DOD. And um, I don't know about you, but I don't really see a mechanism for that springing back anytime soon uh, because uh, although everyone bemoans the persecution of state in this era, you know, no one really wants to rebuild it, it seems. We'll see what Mr. Pompeo wants to do. Uh, 
Um, but there's also this sense that uh, you know it is really the the hammer for all for all nails. But do you get a sense from uh, you know your former colleagues, both in uniform and out, that that they are ex exasperated that it's all going in this direction? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of frustration, and there's there's a lot of sense certainly within the the military of what are we supposed to be doing? You know, what's our, what's our mission right now? You want us to get, vaccinate the cows and you want us to go, you know, police the border and you want us to go bomb things in Syria and, and pick, pick some of these because it's, it's very hard to train to do everything, right? And I think one of the sort of takeaways after 9-11 for senior military leaders was this, was this sort of impossible lesson, this unimplementable lesson. You know, on September 10th, Nobody important, no, none of the major decision makers are thinking about Afghanistan or Al-Qaeda or anything or civilian planes being used as weapons. Nobody's thinking about this. And then, then you get this terrible attack, um, you know, more Americans killed than during Pearl Harbor. And the takeaway for a lot of senior military leaders was, wow, this, this attack took an unexpected form and came out of nowhere, which means that the next attack will probably be equally unexpected and come from somewhere that we're also not expecting it to come from, which means that we have to be everywhere and we have to do everything um, because you know, we, have to, we have to build relationships with partners, we have to have our ear to the ground for intelligence, we, you know, we have to know every country and every terrain and every cluster of issues and every possible threat. And nobody can do that, right? It's, it's just not possible, even an institution as large as the US military can't do it. You can't be everywhere. You can't do everything. So I, I don't envy senior military leaders because I, I think that there's a, you know, facing a real dilemma of how do you gear up in a world where the threats seem to take so many forms. I, I also think, on, you know, for better or for worse, Dan, I, I think you're quite right that in Washington, particularly during the Obama era, there was a little bit of a moment where everybody was saying, oh, I see we have we have shifted too much money and too many authorities from the civilian sector to the military. We have to rebalance. And there was a lot of talk of, of rebalancing and nothing happened and nothing continues to happen. And the Trump administration's not even interested in that. I, I don't see it happening in, in our political lifetimes. But that actually, the, the, the one piece of, here's, the, here's like the glass, again, the glass half full version. Um, I think there are lots of apocalyptic glass 98% empty versions of this, but um, I, you know, I do think um, the flip side of the militarization of US foreign policy in some ways is the civilianization of the US military um, in terms of both skills and tasks and, and in some ways in terms of norms um, and attitudes. So you know, this is why I say God didn't create these categories we did. You know, the other way to address it is to sort of embrace reality, embrace where we are and say, okay, it looks like we have dismantled the traditional civilian apparatus of foreign policy. We probably shouldn't have done that, but we did. You know, and it's now going to be really hard to fix that. If, in fact, it's unlikely that we will be able to fix that. On the other hand, we have this enormous military. People are just throwing money at it. Congress just can't stop itself from throwing money at it. Um, let's think about how we make the military do this wide range of tasks, but do it more effectively, more transparently, and with more accountability, maybe there's a way to do that. It's going to be hard, but I think that there's actually greater likelihood that we can do that than that we can sort of turn the clock back. Well, I have to say, it's great to meet someone who's uh, still somehow more pessimistic than <laughs> I am about the future. But um, so, you know, it, it is. It is true that I mean the civilianization of the American military. What's also true is the 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 standardization or the the confines that the military operates under have changed dramatically, and that's why, interestingly, one of the complaints we hear most often is that there's a lawyer looking over the shoulder of every single yeah. uh, field commander, and um, you know we still have atrocities from time to time, but um, the you know the inculcation of a, of an understanding of what is legitimate and what is lot, not right. legitimate among in the force is a pretty remarkable thing. Um, and the other thing that I find interesting, which I think sort of pushes a, a little bit uh, against your argument, is that 
you know, we are everywhere and we are doing all kinds of things, but, uh, but we have gone, at least until Trump, to great lengths to uh, carefully delineate the places where we're using lethal force, okay? So we have troops in 120 countries, but in... 172. 172, but in 165 of them, they're just training people. Uh, or occasionally getting out of line as they did in Niger and doing unauthorized things. But in, um, in most of those places, we're actually, you could argue, um, helping countries you know, to a better or worse, or worse effect, but you know, still helping them take care of their own neighborhoods. That's a little bit misleading, though, because sometimes just training people are, and for instance, we're actively engaged in Saudi Arabia's uh, conflict in Yemen. Technically, we're not engaged in combat operations in Yemen, but we are providing targeting information. Mm -hmm. We're providing intelligence. So, so I, I, I think that, that part of the story of the book, in some ways, is that the line between war, war activities and not war activities has itself gotten blurry. So often, helping, helping partners and allies take care of their neighborhood starts looking harder and harder to distinguish from warfare itself. Um, you know, one of the things I, I talk about a little bit in, in the book is the, the military doctrine that emerged in the uh, uh, early 2000s of uh, full spectrum combat, full spectrum conflict, where the military divides the world into phases from phase zero uh, uh, on. And, you know, phase zero is, is preparing the battle space. Um, uh, developing relationships, gathering information, um, what, what one used to call peacetime, we now call phase zero operations, mm -hmm. right? And all the way up to you know, active military operations, combat as we know it, uh, on a very large scale. But the, the idea is that you're always in one of the phases of, you know, there's no such thing as peacetime anymore, it's just phase zero, to the point that even, well, this, this is getting too esoteric probably for most people, that that the lines between what counts as covert operations that requires the intelligence committees to be notified in a presidential finding and what counts as traditional military operations, which is in this little loophole arena where you don't need a finding or the intelligence committee oversight, that you can engage in traditional military operations in phase zero and sort of evade oversight. So, so, so I, I think that, that you're absolutely right. I mean, there are, there are countries where we have a military presence and all they're doing is vaccinating the cows, you know, and guarding the embassy. Um, but, but more than the sort of restricted number of places where we acknowledge that we're engaged in ongoing combat operations, we're engaged in stuff that in all kinds of ways sort of looks like ongoing combat operations. Okay, we're going to agree to disagree then, because I think there are a lot of places where we actually do have train and equip missions, and you always have to guard against mission creep, but um, I think, I mean, my view is that we have a big interest in having uh, partners who are capable states. Oh, I agree, I, and this is, yeah. the, my, my comment is not to say, I, I don't think this is all part of a nefarious conspiracy, yeah. right? I think this is an inevitable and probably, and in many ways, probably necessary response to a changing geopolitical landscape. I think that in a circumstance in which the world has changed but we haven't updated our laws or institutions, we get into problems. But, but I, I, don't know that, I don't know that we could do otherwise. Right, so um, we'll open it up in, in a second, but um, by the way, just you know, on this whole issue of what phase you're in and things, uh, you've probably had the same experience I, I've had, which is to be in meetings where they're talking about you know, OPE, which I can't remember what it stands for, but it's one of those early things that you do that you're preparing the environment or you're doing passive surveillance or something like that. And I've actually heard four-star generals disagree about what it means, mm -hmm. which really doesn't uh, encourage you <laughs> about how they're, they're carrying these things uh, uh, forward. But um, you know, one thing that I'd be curious about is that on those... On the, at the same time that you see this kind of uh, militarization of, of the universe, I mean, it sort of coincides, if you believe Professor Pinker and lots of other statistics, with an overall decline in violence and uh, in the world. And that is a really curious thing that maybe would 
be too hard to really think through. But I'm curious if that's if you've dealt with that at yeah, all. Yeah. So I'm pretty skeptical of the Pinker argument that that violence is declining and everybody's getting nicer and our better angels are taking over. Um, and I'm skeptical, largely, I mean, there have been all kinds of critiques of his arguments, including that he has to sort of edit World War I and II out of the picture to, mm. to make this work statistically. But, but even more than that, I, I, I'm skeptical because I think the, the no question, you know, the post-World War II period, we've seen a, a dramatic decline in interstate conflict, conflict between powerful states, but, but 75 years is the blink of an eye in human history. There have been plenty of other periods in which we have seen relative peace and quiet only to erupt again. Um, so I'm, I partly just think that humility requires us to acknowledge that the, the last uh, seven and a half decades is not really much to go on. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, I, but I also, he may be right, you know, um, but, but I guess the other two asterisks that I would add, um, one is that although human life for most individuals around the globe is less precarious than at most other points in human history in terms of the likelihood that you would die of disease or violence, um, you know, most of the globe you're now likely to live a longer, healthier life um, than at any prior time. But the sort of risk for the, the species level risk is arguably higher than it's mm -hmm. ever been between things like climate change and the still present risk of you know, nuclear catastrophe or a killer virus. You know, that arguably that even as individuals' lives are safer, the species level risk is now higher, although we have no real ability to quantify that risk. Um, so I don't know how much we should pat ourselves on the back for the decline in violence. And then I guess the, the, the third point, you know, one of the things that's really interesting and it'd be you know, fascinating to see how it plays out, it's also kind of scary. And one of the things that I, I talk about a fair amount in the book is that we, we're shifting to various non-lethal forms of control and coercion. And why would you uh, go kill a bunch of people and pile up a bunch of bloody bodies if you can achieve the traditional ends of warfare using cyber or using something else or using you know, Facebook or Cambridge Analytics or whatever the heck we're using. You know, there's no reason that you would, um, but I'm not sure I like that world a whole lot better. I mean, clearly, it's, clearly it is good if fewer people are dying, but if we're entering a world, as I fear sometimes we may be, in which the, there is less bloodshed but more invisible forms of coercion and control that becomes more widespread. Uh, I'm not entirely sure mm -hmm. that human species is, is a whole lot better off. But you're not nostalgic for uh, Tamerlane's pyramids of skulls no. or anything like that. <laughs> no, I'm not. Because I know that you, know, you get that side, so uh, I just wanted to <laughs> no, check. So just, just two footnotes to your uh, presentation. One is that uh, in the days before there were there was a whole shopping mall in the uh, in the Pentagon. There was a um, uh, a snack bar uh, right in the middle of There's the Pentagon. There's still a snack bar right in the middle of the Pentagon. Yes, but uh, does Ground it have the same Ground Zero name? Cafe. What? Ground Zero Cafe. Exactly. But I thought it I thought it was gone. No. <laughs> no. Well, and no, of course now Ground Zero is in New York, but yeah. uh, no, it's they, still, they do still, still have hanging Ground in Zero there. there. They have bad hot dogs. The other thing uh, is that um, I I have had personal experience of the in the civilianization of the military, because I remember in 19, um, it was 92, I was, or 93, it was 93, I was visiting a mutual friend of ours, I think she's a mutual friend, Sarah Sewell, who was mm -hmm. then uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, Peacekeeping, and uh, this was right after the Clinton people came in, and she uh, saw me and shrieked, we'd gone to graduate school together and uh, used a, shall we say, a kind of friendly name, which I'm not going to repeat here, and gave me a big hug. And my <laughs> we minder, all want to know what your nickname was. Yeah, my minder <laughs> was a guy, a, a, a naval officer in his whites, and I thought he was going to um, <laughs> have a stroke right then and there, or, have to, or you know, separate us because that, that kind of fraternization in the Pentagon was not allowed. But, you know, 15 years later, that, wouldn't, that wasn't so surprising, I guess, to actually give someone in the hall a hug in the hall of the Pentagon. <laughs> So uh, there has been a change. So with that, why don't we open up to questions and uh, we'll take it from there. Oh my God, it's an embarrassment of riches. Uh, Amb Ambassador Steinberg. Yeah, uh, I, I want to change your metaphor. <laughs> 
Hold on, why don't you wait for the, uh, for the microphone? If you perceive everything as a nail, then all you use is a hammer. I, I think I know a very different Washington. I know a Washington where after 9-11, USAID doubled in size because we recognized that the military was not the way to attack these new threats. I saw a Washington where you saw a tenfold increase in development assistance to the poorest of the poor around the world. I saw over the last 20 years, a billion people around the world moved across the poverty line. Infant mortality declined in half. I saw USAID and State Department people in far more than 172 countries and a reaffirmation of our role in the world through defense, diplomacy, and development. My concern at this point is that we're not focusing on the trends that had occurred up until 2017, and we're allowing this to be perceived as the pendulum swinging back. I would also remind you that every one of the phenomena that you mentioned, I grew up with with Vietnam. We never declared war in Vietnam. It was the biggest war we ever occurred, uh, we ever experienced in, uh, uh, since the Civil War, since World War II. And the other factor there is we did some horrendous things there under the shade of war, under the, you know, there are a lot of ways to take one piece of wood and attach it to another piece of wood. And if you think all there is is a nail, then you will indeed use a hammer. But if you want to draw the society together, you can equally lose glue. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I should say, uh, I don't think the trends that I talk about in the book sort of started after 9-11. I think they accelerated in many ways after 9-11, but they have been, you know, the, they've been there with us for some time. And indeed, uh, you know, I think one of the conundrums is that they're, you know, as, as in some ways, the examples of the Navajo and the Berserkers and the Makeo suggest although most societies have tried to draw sharp lines between war and not war, they've drawn them in different places at different times, and those lines are always being challenged. They're always being redrawn. Uh, I, I also think in some ways we're in a back to the future moment. Um, when you, there, there have been many periods of human history, including Western history, in which the lines between military and non-military, war and not war, have been awfully blurry. One of my favorite examples is, is the British East India Company. Uh, was it an army? Uh, was it a profit-making company? Um, was it a government? Was it a norm entrepreneur? Uh, you know, was it a you know, genocidal human rights abuser? It was sort of all of these things, right? The difference today is not that, this is certainly not the first moment in human history when we've had a lot of actors who seem to challenge any simple categorization. I think what is different now um, uh, is that we live at a moment when our expectations of the level of transparency and accountability, legal and otherwise, uh, for large-scale global actors has, have gone up. Uh, that we live, you know, we live in a legal moment in some ways. We live in a moment where we expect behavior that is according to some set of known rules and principles, and we are confounded in a way that we weren't 500 years ago or 300 years ago or, or, you know, or even 150 years ago when the players won't stay in their boxes. Um, so in some ways, it's a, it's a challenge of you know, the, the, the normative evolution has outpaced the institutional evolution, which is part of the reason I say to Dan that you know, the answer may not lie in let's, let's sort of roll back these recent changes. Maybe it lies instead in adapting our institutions and adapting our rules. Um, I think you're, you're I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. There have been unbelievable things done by US diplomats and development workers uh, since 9-11, often in incredibly adverse situations. I think overall the trend in terms of the size of the budgets uh, for those uh, agencies compared to the Pentagon and sort of shifting authorities has not been a happy story for those agencies predating Donald Trump. I mean, Trump, clearly Trump has sort of taken this to an extreme. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're 
more aware than I of, of how unhappy the State Department has been in the last uh, 14 months or whatever it is. Um, but I think, I think unfortunately, uh, in many ways, the, the, the difficulty in getting adequate resources and authorities relative to the military sort of incursions into those areas is not just a, a, a Trump era one. Right. Professor Valentino. Um, so I had a question. I wanted you to reflect a little bit about the Obama administration and, and maybe uh, preface this, see if I can't out pessimist you. Um, in the book, <laughs> you did. <laughs> in, the, in the book, you did uh, uh, note that although a lot of people had high hopes for Obama to reverse mm -hmm. uh, some of these trends, maybe the best we can say is that he slowed uh, some of them uh, down a bit. Um, but you guys both worked uh, in the Obama administration, and this was a president who's promised us uh, he closed Guantanamo, and of course wasn't able to do that. Not but he wanted to genuinely uh, close it, but obviously Congress wouldn't let him. But Congress didn't force him then to massively increase the drone strikes that we did, so that instead of locking people up in Guantanamo, they never made it to um, a prison. He said he wanted uh, a new uh, version of the AUMF. Um, but again, uh, that never happened. He increased the amount of domestic surveillance uh, and, the, and the amount of prosecution of journalists um, uh, to a level that was even higher than the Bush administration. And then he said, uh, he admitted that during the Bush administration, we tortured some folks. Uh, and even though our domestic laws, not just international laws, our domestic laws require us to prosecute people when we believe they've tortured um, folks, um, he didn't, uh, uh, and his Justice Department did not carry forward any um, actions on that level. Uh, the, the reason I, I think this ought to out-pessimist you is that I'm, I'm skeptical about these institutional changes, maybe even more than you are, uh, on either side, either that Congress will, will make some major changes, or as you said in the book, maybe the, the courts will, uh, will solve some of these problems, and we'll have special courts to approve drone strikes, or you know, Dershowitz wants special courts to approve torture, or something like that. I think that's quite unlikely. My hope was that um, we might elect political leaders who will simply decide not to use the institutions that we have in ways that are quite so troubling to us. But if Obama, who was a law professor and understood these issues probably better than anyone we can hope um, to serve in that office, did all those things that I mentioned and, and more, you know, what's the, what's the hope that um, we're gonna see progress on that in, in terms of you know, a new policymaker in the White House? Yeah, you can't out-pessimist me. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I think that's right. I, I'm not optimistic. Um, in, indeed, I'll, I'll go you one further and say that um, the, the trends with which we're struggling here in the US are, are trends with which the world is struggling. You know, how, do you, how do you draw lines and contain and constrain uh, conflict in an era of you know, cyber attacks? You know, how do you contain and constrain conflict when it may be bioengineered, DNA-linked viruses next, and so forth. Um, I think that we, the United States, have been, you know, through a series of, of administrations, um, we have been complicit in allowing international institutions to, in many ways, decay because it was convenient for us to be, you know, one of the big gorillas. Uh, and so we didn't try to build up more. We certainly didn't try very hard to build up more robust and inclusive global government institutions, and that was fine as long as we were the big gorilla. It's gonna be less good for us as we cease to be the big gorilla, and I think we are, we are rapidly, we are, we are in decline of empire stage. Um, uh, I also think that partly because of the growing ambiguity um, of our uh, legal concepts internationally as well as domestically and the, the, glow, the growing in, in efficacy of global institutions when it comes to troubleshooting problems and conflict, that the risk of great power conflict has gone up, that you see, I mean, you see it in the you know, Russian election meddling and influence campaigns, you know, that, that we've created an environment in which there are all kinds of in incentives for states to sort of push the boundaries in that you know, gray zone uh, in ways that increase the risk of, of unintended escalation. And I think there's, 
there's this sort of happy, happy story um, that international lawyers like to tell. Um, and it, it goes sort of like this. It sort of says, well, you know, the world was messy and horrible and violent, and we had the 30 years war, and that was really bad, and you know, um, but then we came up with the Peace of Westphalia, and that was awesome, and it created the modern nation state system, and that was so much better at a way of ordering the international community. But then those nation states sort of got a little out of control, and they fought with each other, and that was really bad. And we had World War I, and we had World War II, and that was really bad. But lo and behold, out of the ashes, we, we came up with the UN charter system. And look, Steven Pinker says, you know, life is good, and interstate conflict has declined, and isn't that a wonderful story? We've got all this you know, resurgence of international law and multilateral treaties, and the WTO, hooray. And the, the thing that, lets, that gets left out of that story or, or sort of underplayed is that the, you know, the, these moments of um, the proliferation, the reinvention of institutions and norms in the international stage, you know, all follow these cataclysmic conflicts. You know, the Thirty Years' War wipes out what, you know, a third of the Central European population. World Wars I and II together wipe out, you know, millions and millions of people uh, and leave, you know, major cities in Europe and the Pacific in you know, rubble. Um, and so we come up with these new, you know, we, we, we solve these problems. We're good at reinventing things, but, but only in the wake of catastrophe. Um, so my, my pessimistic fear is we're, we're at another one of those moments where the sort of the architecture, the international architecture, both legal and institutional, is, is sort of creaking and falling and failing. Uh, and I would like to believe that we are creative enough and prescient enough to reinvent it to solve the wide range of collective problems that we now have uh, before it collapses into another cataclysmic conflict, but, but I'm not particularly confident that we will be. Well, I, I hate being the Pollyanna around here, because it's so out of character, but, um, uh, but I, I would just say, Ben, that I, I think that <laughs> you're being kind of linear there, uh, and I would just say you know, the period of the Obama administration still saw significant rises in uh, funding for state and AID, um, that yes, we had uh, drone strikes, but drone strikes were a pretty uh, efficient way of dealing with a threat that didn't require you know, far bloodier engagements uh, or the deployment of large you know, numbers of troops. And while there's no you know, panacea, I'll take a drone strike over an invasion of uh, Afghanistan or uh, Iraq uh, any day, um, we are definitely at, at a kind of critical moment because we're now being led by people who, uh, you know, frankly don't share the values that have uh, animated most American statecraft for a long time. And um, they're in some ways building on the wreckage of, uh, you know, that began with the Bush administration. And I'm, I'm always depressed at how people seem to forget what a, what a disaster that was in terms of the invasion of Iraq and the destabilization of, of the Middle East. But, um, you know, it, it, I, I worry about our coming back to a place of uh, leadership in the world after, after these two uh, kind of disastrous interludes. But I, I don't think that it's necessarily the case that uh, we're just uh, careening, you know, down into a toilet when we may be having some kind of strange dialectic that is very hard to perceive at this point from inside at all. Anyway, enough blather. Uh, I had this question in mind before you uh, referred to the covert activities, uh, so it's still a genuine question. Um, uh, could we minimize this concern about what's military responsibility, what is wartime and isn't, and all of the psychic energy involved with it, if we use covert operations more. And would that be a good thing? Uh, one problem is you can't brag about your successes because they're covert acti activities. So I'm thinking, should the CIA be used more? Uh, the military has its own intelligence, of course, act act activities. But would it, would it help to study that relationship and rely more upon the covert uh, side of things to provide security? Yeah, it's a good that's a question. Good question. It, it is a good question, and, and I guess I, I have a couple of thoughts that aren't entirely connected. Um, 
One is that we are using the covert side more. Um, and one of the pieces of this whole story um, has been um, the sort of militarization of the CIA uh, uh, going from intelligence gathering entity to an operational organization in the post 9-11 era. Um, the, we've dramatically beefed up the, the paramilitary side of the CIA and that's certainly an area where we've actually seen a lot of blurriness where we, whether a particular raid or strike is dubbed a we often have we often have essentially combined teams of military personnel and uh, intelligence personnel engaged in the same raid, and and I do think there's actually been some game playing during both the Obama administration and and today, where literally whether an operation is deemed a military operation or an or a, or an intelligence operation, it has it's sort of more about executive branch forum shopping than anything else. That that you sort of go, huh. Will the intelligence committees or the military or the armed forces committees be more tolerant about this? And if we decide that it's the intelligence committees, then we we promptly designate a CIA person as the lead on the operation, and we second the military personnel to the CIA for the duration. If we decide the other way around, we do the reverse. And and I'm not crazy about that, right? Because I think it is it is uh, it is done in order to and has the effect of evading the. Uh, constitutional and statutory oversight mechanisms, which never work very well anyway, but, but it weakens them still further. Um, I, I do, it, it, I, here's an area where I find myself very ambivalent is the second thing. You know, on the one hand, my, in general, I'm not a huge fan of covert operations because I believe in accountability. I believe in a democracy, it's really important to have as much transparency as possible. And when we send people out into the world to risk death or kill other people. Um, I think that is something you know, that, again, in an ideal world, acknowledging that most of the public is kind of checked out, et cetera. But I feel like, no, you don't get to be checked out. Uh, if we're going to do this, people have to be willing to take responsibility for it. So I don't like seeing big swathes of US foreign policy move into the covert realm. That said, and here's why I say I'm ambivalent, you know, there's, there's a there's a kind of a paradox when it comes, if you care about the rule of law. Um, in some ways, if we're gonna break the rules, I'd rather us do it in secret than do it in public. Because if you do it in secret, you know, the, there, there is an argument that says, uh, you know, if you think about international stability, you know, espionage and covert operations occupy one of these weird corners of the law where everybody says, yeah, that's kind of illegal, but it's also kind of legal because everybody does it and we tolerate it. You know, and, and if you want to maintain clear and effective international rules concerning the use of force, um, um, and you have a superpower that engages in what often looks like flagrant law breaking, I think that's out, right out in the open. Hey, we're invading Iraq or whatever. You know, in a certain way, um, I think that can be terribly, terribly dangerous and terribly damaging to the fabric of international institutions and I would rather have us do the occasional covert, wink, wink, we didn't do it, because I think that that's sort of less, the system, I think the system can kind of tolerate law breaking that is occasional and in the corner. It can't tolerate repeated flagrant law breaking and challenges to the rules. So, so a little part of me feels like, yeah, if we're gonna do it, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but, I, but I'm not super comfortable with the part of me that feels that way. And very little remains secret. Right, and there are no secrets anymore I mean, because it's just a, it, because the whole idea of covert operations is is very tenuous at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, assuming that the trends you discussed, like the militarization of foreign policy, continue, do you think state and the traditional diplomatic institutions are destined to remain sidelined, or? Does the changing environment present new opportunities that will allow the State Department and USAID to reassert itself or perhaps change their roles? Yeah, I mean, I don't believe in you know, predestination on this. I think it's, it's all up to us. Um, it will be interesting. I'm not a big fan of Mike Pompeo, but, but it will be interesting to see if just as an institutional matter, he's able to bring the State Department back in more central role. And I, you know, I think in the last year, uh, we've really seen the State Department completely sidelined. Um, uh, 
But I do think that there would also need to be some sort of boring institutional changes in, in State Department culture and, and policies um, to make it possible. I mean, some of the challenges, for instance, the, the military's combatant commands are organized geographically. So you have you know, CENTCOM, for instance, or, or AFRICOM, or PACOM, Pacific Command. And, um, and so you have a single four-star general or admiral who is interacting with the military and political leaders in you know, two or three dozen countries on a regional level, whereas the State Department is still, you know, the, the primary relationship unit is still kind of bilateral. We have an ambassador to country X. Um, and that the, there have been all kinds of internal calls for reform within the State Department to sort of think about you know, making the, the uh, regional diplomacy more parallel to the militaries to make it more effective. Um, I think that we probably would need to see something like that. I also think that we, we have developed a kind of a zero risk tolerance approach for our diplomats and Benghazi did not help. Um, you know, that the, the atmosphere after Benghazi was um, nobody is willing to let anybody take any risk. Needless to say, if you want to be an effective diplomat, you have to be talking to people and you have to be talking to people who aren't just your counterparts in the foreign ministry of the state that you're in. Um, I remember even years ago, this was way before Benghazi, when I was a young, young State Department official um, and I had worked for human rights organizations in conflict zones and just gone everywhere, um, going to the State Department and, and discovering how restricted I was in terms of embassy restriction places like Kosovo, you can't go here, you can't go there, it's too dangerous. And being kind of shocked by that and thinking, you know, how can we be effective if the journalists and the NGO people travel more than we do and talk to more people than we do? The answer is you can't, you know, you're, you're cutting yourself off from valuable information and context. Um, so, so I think that we would have to try to change those things. And I, I, th I think that you know, Secretary Clinton did, Hillary Clinton, when she was secretary, did try, and indeed uh, there were efforts before her as well to create more of an expeditionary mentality in the State Department, um, but, but for reasons of both culture and policies uh, and funding and legal risk, it's really, really hard. So, so, so nothing is destined, but, but I do think that the the odds are kind of stacked against the State Department right now in terms of regaining a, a larger role uh, at the forefront of international affairs. Call on a woman. Stuart. What? Woman. Call on a woman, I said. I just did. Good. Awesome. Sorry. <laughs> just saying. I'm going to preface this with I'm a Roman historian, so uh, we're really going to get a deeper view here. But um, there's something called the Stobi Papyrus that describes the activities of the Roman army, um, which was deployed on the Danube. And in a month of record keeping, and, and it was one of the few institutions that actually kept records in the ancient world, in one month, that unit um, went after a force that was crossing the frontier, so it was a police action against a foreign invader. It policed the harvesting of grain. A small corps of men were sent to Gaul on a special mission, and there was a regular um, policing for the governor. And my point is that I don't know if the US Army is that unusual in its functioning, but what, but what I know from the Roman case is that there was a deep distrust of the use of force, and so what the Roman state did was condense it into one institution that could then be controlled, and that that institution became multifunctional, and I'm wondering if that kind of structural analysis yeah. would be beneficial for thinking about what's happening in, in our own country, because less it, it, the use of force in America, the army, the military, is what percentage of the population. We're really concentrating a whole variety of activities in a very small portion of our population. And they are subject to a completely different kind of decision-making process than it would be if it were more broadly based. Mm -hmm. And I know that's what Rome did. And 
And my second, and, and they did it, and they called it the Pax Romana, right. which is funny, because there was no Pax, <laughs> right? But it was that maybe 90% of the population was no longer actively involved in all of that kind of decision making. The second thing that I would, as I was listening to you, because I think you've got two different arguments going, and I'm wondering if separating them, you know, I've been, I've been rewriting these arguments in my head with my Roman history, is that one of the things that really changed at Rome at one point is that war was publicly declared and covert actions or drone strikes. I mean, who decides what a combatant is and what is the process where you actually lay claim? How do you know you've got an enemy? There's a very clear public process that was relied on. And when you step back from that, what, what do you get? And I'm not, I, it's not bellum justum, not, I, you know, I don't want to go there. But, but just this, there's, they're the fetiales at Rome, and, and there's a process that surrounds them that I think our own country is stepping back from. But I wanted to tell you about the Stobi papyrus, because it's, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. And it had, it's, it's the Roman army. I don't think we're exceptional there. Yeah. Um, no, that's fascinating. And, and, and no, and as I said, I, I don't think there's anything magic about these categories, right? I mean, we're, we're, hey, we're humans. We get to do whatever we want. If we want to say, you know, we're going to decide that the institution that we're going to call the military is now going to be, you know, three quarters a cattle vaccination operation and, you know, one quarter, you know, dropping bombs on people, we get to do that. You know, we, we can do whatever we want, right, in a, in a, in a certain abstract sense. Um, you know, we can say we're not going to have a different set of rules apply. We're going to have the same set of rules apply. Or we can, we can do whatever we want. Um, and we, we, what we do should be driven by a combination of, you know, clear-headedness about the world around us and, and what the threats to U.S. and global security are and trying to match our capabilities and our institutions to meeting those threats combined with, with attention to our values, you know, and I think I'd like to believe that one of our American values, you know, that the whole idea of the Declaration of Independence is, is deeply rooted in the idea that no entity, including the state, is so powerful that it can be permitted to operate unaccountably, that there must be all, all actors must be rule bound and that the public must have the information and the institutions that are necessary to effectively make decisions on the use of force and other forms of coercion. And increasingly, you know, force has a lot of competition for you know, successful means of coercion right now, that, that we need to be the, the, the ability to make decisions about that and to understand what is being done in our name and to be able to change it. You know, and that's what matters, not whether the people doing the coercing are using bombs or computer viruses and, and not whether they're wearing uniforms or not wearing uniforms. Like at the end of the day, that's what matters, right? So, so, so that's what I care more about. And I think, I think the problem for us at the moment is not that we have you know, messed up some divine ordinance about you know, what militaries are supposed to do and so forth. It's more that we, we, we were at a moment where there's a the, the mismatch between sort of life as it is and threats as they are and the categories and rule-based rule, rule -based system that we've created is such that we have both created a lot of confusion about who should do what, but, but from a rule of law perspective, we have created a lot of activities that are in a gray zone that are making power unaccountable. And that's what really, what, what really troubles me about it. Um, the only thing I would add to that, though, there's, there's also nothing new about the US military being small and divorced from the rest of the population. You know, that we, for most of US history, the, the military was tiny and highly professionalized and highly separate from the rest of society. It's sort of only a problem if it's a problem, right? And, and for much of our history, you know, the military was off fighting small wars and it wasn't necessarily a problem for American democracy, although it was a problem for the people they were fighting small wars against who didn't like it that much, generally speaking. Um, but but uh, you know that I do think there's a sort of cultural nostalgia, which I find really weird, you know, for like World War II as the halcyon period of civil-military relations, where you know 10% of the male populations in uniform and so on, 
And although there was, you know, I think that did have benefits in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of social mixing, in terms of giving a broader population a stake in war and peace. Um, obviously, the, that was anomalous. That was both anomalous and it was only happening because millions of people were dying all around the globe. Um, so I don't, I, don't know that the, I don't know that the smallness or even the insularity of the institution are inherently problematic. I think it's more that when, when the smallness and insularity translates into an inability to effectively oversee or constrain, that's, that's when you start having problems. And we, we do have those problems now. Well, we should, we're, we're already past the witching hour. Um, you had your hand up? Students always get priority. <laughs> yes. So is the phenomena of Walmartization of the US Army seen in other countries as well right now, or is it just limited to US? Um, I, yes, that's, that's also a very good question. Um, I think it plays out in really different ways, kind of country by country. Um, you know, and I, I often have people challenge me when I say things like, well, you know, there'd be nothing inherently wrong with saying, fine, let the military do everything as long as it's accountable and so forth, and they say, you know, this is not a good idea in Argentina. This is not a good idea in Pakistan. This is not a good idea, you know, that, that, that this maybe would be workable in a country with a really robust rule of law tradition and a really robust tradition of civilian control. But, you know, in country X, Y, or Z, where there have been a series of coups, where the military has long been the only effective institution, that's dangerous. And on the other hand, I think that there are other countries where the issues just play out in really different ways. And, and all of this is confounded by this strange historical moment when we continue to see you know, good old fashioned bloody conflict uh, in places such as Syria where the bodies are piling up, um, but, at, but increasingly actors ranging from non-state groups to major powers are finding that non-lethal forms of coercion and control are more effective at achieving their political objectives than the use of force. And what that does is it, you know, I mean, even just thinking about civilian control of the military issues here in the United States, our, our tradition of civilian control of the military originates in the, the founders of the American Republic being concerned about a concentration of power, being able to capture the state. Well, today, there are a lot of concentrations of power that are, have been really successful at capturing chunks of the state, and the military in some ways is the least of them, right? You know, that, that, that force has more competition. If you're worried about preserving democracy, I'm not sure the military in the US is, is a greater threat than concentrated money, for instance, um, you know, or than you know, Russian information warfare. Um, so, so I think it's, I, I don't have an answer. It's a good question, but I do think that it is, is very, very country and culture specific. So I'm, I'm afraid we have to call this uh, to a close because uh, um, there are 20 or 30 undergraduates who uh, didn't make it here who are waiting to have dinner with uh, Professor Brooks. Let's not analyze the incentive structure associated <laughs> with all that um, and just thank her heartily for a really interesting talk. <laughs>